That was track one from the Pet Sounds album, 1966, The Beach Boys, with Wouldn't It Be Nice. David Beard of Endless Summer Quarterly magazine joins us once again to go track by track discussing this uh, landmark album. David, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me on. Our pleasure. This will be a two-part discussion on Pet Sounds. It's such a huge album in the history of rock and roll that to rush through it wouldn't be doing it justice. So we'll see how far we get today. But David, I heard this album as a little kid in the full flush of Beach Boys mania in the mid-70s, spurred on by the release of the Endless Summer compilation in 1974, and I was trying to get my hands on every single Beach Boys album. I heard it at the time. I remembered loving Wouldn't It Be Nice and Sloop John B., but that was really about it. It didn't resonate with me until much later, when I was a young man, and going through my first serious relationship and first serious breakup. Then, when I went back and listened to Pet Sounds, it was like everything that was happening in that relationship, every thought I was thinking, was on that record. What's your experience with Pet Sounds? It's it's quite similar. Um, I can't remember the age that I was when the first time I listened through. I do remember the song that stood out to me on my first listen was That's Not Me. And I don't know why. There was something, and maybe it was Mike's voice, because I knew I had the best of the Beach Boys Mm -hmm. um, before I had Endless Summer. So I had the best of the Beach Boys, and then I got Pet Sounds. Because it's just, it was a Beach Boys album that I saw in the record store, and I bought it. Right. You know, a couple of years later, three years later, four years later, whatever it was, I was in my early 20s, and like you, um... I wasn't going through a a relationship situation, but my life had changed and I was getting older and there was something about the album. I heard it and I went, wow, I should have been listening all along. And I know it's somewhat controversial among Beach Boys fans to suggest this, but to me, Pet Sounds feels like a concept album. You go from the excitement of a new romance to bitter disappointment and it takes you on that journey. I don't know if it was intentional or not, but that's how the album always felt to me. Sure, it, it, it certainly, I think, is that. Um, there's a, a movement throughout this music, and uh, the movement is, is Brian Wilson. You know, he's the one responsible for the arrangements. With the addition of the Wrecking Crew, Brian feeding off them, them feeding off Brian, the Wrecking Crew being able to quickly record for Brian within a number of takes and get to the sound and the idea of what he was, you know, hearing in his head, that was tremendous because you're dealing with four tracks. Brian had to become really focused on on communicating what he was hearing because right. he wasn't a guy who walked around and wrote on the charts. There was no, Brian didn't do that. He would tell them the keys that he wanted, you know, the notes and everything. So he was able to connect to the things that he was feeling and actually put them down in pure music form. Danny Hutton's quoted as saying, you know, how he was in the studio watching Brian work. And you can hear this in the Pet Sound sessions. Brian is telling one of the musicians, one of the wrecking crew out in the, uh, out in the studio, listen, hey, right there, can you just kind of turn away? <laughs> there's something about that specific instrument that he's saying, hey, I want you to turn away because there's something he's hearing that is representing. Okay, and this is why I think we all make this connection of it being a concept album. Brian's communicating something that he is feeling, like you're some, the relationship, you're being pulled apart from someone. So he would, he would find a way to communicate that. And the best thing about the Pet Sound Sessions box is really to listen to the tracks, just the recordings. Because the foundation of Pet Sounds is Brian's arrangements and compositions for those tracks. Not the songs with the vocals on them, but the tracks. Well, speaking of tracks, let's get into it. Beginning with the song we just heard at the top of this interview, Wouldn't It Be Nice? Track one on Pet Sounds. It's the perfect song to start this album. Um, The second you hear those notes, you're drawn in. There's two different ways to listen to this stuff because it's so rich. But Wouldn't It Be Nice is such a great song that... If, if you're listening to the Pet Sounds in album in its entirety and you're putting this on and you're hearing Wouldn't It Be Nice, it's kind of like you're familiar with it and the reason you're, you're going back to it is you're allowing yourself to reinvest emotionally in your, connect, your personal connection to the music. And I think this song just does it like right after, you know, da 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 boom. Yeah. For me, I'm in. We had talked about this uh, before. You'd said that it's almost an impatient love song, which I like that description of it. 
yeah, you know, maybe if we think and wish and hope and pray, it might come true. Now, right there, it's maybe if. It's kind of, hey, it's relaxed. But then the big right. kettle drum, it's like, but at the same time, can't, can't we just get there? Can't we just do it already? <laughs> right. I mean, that's kind of the angst that is set up in this wonderful pop song. It's ba-bum, ba-bum. Right. That's the pulse of Brian. His pulse, you know, his blood is rushing. It pulls you in and kind of gets things going perfectly as a first song for the album cycle. Well, we've already heard the studio version of Wouldn't It Be Nice from Pet Sound, so let's hear how the guys handled it live on their 1973 release, The Beach Boys in Concert. We're back talking to editor of Endless Summer Quarterly magazine, David Beard, about the Beach Boys' Pet Sounds album, and we move on to track two. Now, if the protagonist of Wouldn't It Be Nice is still singing the same cut, You Still Believe in Me, here, the bloom is off the rose. (laughs) The relationship was exciting and fresh and fun, but now the guy realizes that the girl knows the real him, and he's not maybe all that he's cracked up to be, but... Despite it all, she still believes in him. Yeah, again, lyrics uh, co-written with Tony Asher. Um, absolutely, Brian was involved in writing the lyrical content mm-hmm. of this song. Because second song in, he's ready to reveal himself. He's ready to say, hey, I'm, I'm just like anybody else. I'm, I've got doubts. And uh, he's singing to this, this female, who I really do think this was, to Marilyn, I do. Yeah. I think a lot of Pet Sounds is a very personal message, either to his wife or his group. That's what Pet Sounds is. I, and, and again, this is before we even get to the lyrical content. That's what makes it such an incredible album, is Brian had the ability to emotionally evolve himself to the point where he could put it in music arrangements. I believe that's why Pet Sounds is so universally received. That was track two from Pet Sounds, You Still Believe in Me. And I should point out to the audience that we are playing the stereo versions of these songs. Originally, the album was released in mono. And we're also just focusing on side one today with Endless Summer Quarterly's David Beard. And that takes us to track three and the song that first resonated with you, That's Not Me. What I like about this song, well, there's so much to like about this song, but... I like the fact that it's Mike singing it, because usually Mike is very cocky and confident on a lot of the songs that Mike sang lead on, and here, your protagonist is riddled with self-doubt, and it's really interesting to hear Mike handle this. Yeah, one discussion that's kind of been uh, circulated over the years since the album's release Uh, among Beach Boy fans, and I don't know if it extends outside of that, but one of the conversations has has been at least on, you know, several occasions is this this Pet Sounds could have easily been a Brian Wilson solo album. And I think that's true. But the reason it's not is because Brian knew better. He was satisfied with the track recordings. He was satisfied with the material he came up with Tony Asher. And he knew to get vocal satisfaction... It couldn't just be him. Yep. That was the other beautiful thing that I think makes Pet Sounds kind of like the icing on the cake of the whole great listening experience in an album format is you have these voices. And as you know, by the end of 66, the Beach Boys were voted the best vocal group in the British poll over the Beatles. And I think that's the one thing that you can say matter-of-factly, and I think most people would agree, 99% of them at least, or maybe it's even higher than that, that the Beach Boys are probably the best vocal group to come out of that era. So Brian was no dummy. So just like he was able to utilize the wrecking crew for the the building of the tracks, he was now going to use the voices of the Beach Boys for the building of the rest of the track. And, you know, the Beach Boys at that time were the age that you and I were speaking to a little bit ago about when we discovered Pet Sounds and when it connected with us in our early 20s. So this is their age. That's where they are. And um, Mike had said, um, when I asked him about this song, he recited, he he, he just started reciting the lyrics. He said, I had to prove that I can make it alone now, but that's not me. It's a very relatable lyric. There are many, many songs, whether they be covers or outside collaborations, they all have their personality and they all have their musical structure. That's Not Me resonated with me because it questioned my philosophy and the way I look at things. 
As a songwriter with the Beach Boys, I've always enjoyed collaborating with Brian on these hits that we recorded. So the lyric, I had to prove that I can make it alone, but that's not me, resonated with me personally as I determined that I was more motivated to be a partner. I had to prove. We'll be back to wrap up our discussion of side one of the Beach Boys Pet Sounds album right after this charming retro-mercial. Hey, tomorrow at high noon. We're back talking with Endless Summer Quarterly Magazine's David Beard about the classic Pet Sounds album by the Beach Boys. And we're up to cut four, a beautiful ballad sung by Brian, Don't Talk, Put Your Head on My Shoulder. This is Brian part two. You still believe in me being part one. Yep. Um, I got to highly recommend to your listeners that they go out and get the Pet Sounds box because you get to hear the instrumental tracking of Don't Talk and it, the strings on this thing. Oh, Lord. You get a whole new sense of what this song is because the strings tell their own story. Just a beautiful track. I have to think that Brian had his uh, then-wife Marilyn in his mind when he wrote that song, too. Yeah, yeah. Up next, track five on the album. This one, unlike a lot of the tracks on here, not written by Tony Asher, but instead, it's I'm Waiting for the Day, written by Brian and Mike. This is a really interesting song, because if you listen to it as a part of the Pet Sounds listening experience, you know, where you're not, there was never an I'm Waiting for the Day single. So if you're, right. unless you're putting the album on and just going right to that song and skipping the other ones to this point, you're not going to kind of catch this. But Because if you listen to it as a part of the song cycle, it just comes right in and it's another relationship song and it's, you know, then out to the next song. Right. But it is pure psychedelic doo-wop. Mike, Mike brings yeah. in his doo-wop influences. Brian bringing, again, the more emotional aspect right, of the arrangement. the introspection, yeah. Um, and then Mike's lyrics and the doo-doo-doo-doo-doo-doo-doo. That, that's, that's pure that's Mike. That's doo-wop. That is, why do fools fall in love? Right. But because of the way it's used in this song and because Pet Sounds being the album that Pet Sounds is, the, the gentleness of Brian on the verses, and then Mike, the raucous vocal in the, on the choruses. Right. I mean, it's... It's, um, a, it's a perfect combination. It is. It's just, it, and it proves, man, it just, it so, it so speaks to the, uh, the, great, uh, the great songwriting team that they were. Next up on side one of Pet Sounds, an instrumental written solely by Brian, called Let's Go Away for a While. Now, I don't know what his intention was here with this cut, but it sounds like it was influenced by what would later be called the exotica genre of music. People like Martin Denny and, and Les Baxter. And if ever there was a song that just symbolized surrendering to wanderlust and getting away from it all, <laughs> it would be this one. Yeah, it, 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 it's kind of a, it's kind of a, um, an emotional, but also kind of a mental escape. Song. Yeah. I think there was an attempt to write lyrics by Tony, but uh, it never went anywhere. Um, you know, in the, in the 97 box set, Brian was quoted as saying, I th when David Leaf interviewed him, he said, I think Burt Bacharach can influence me a little bit with that. If you really analyze it and you think about it, there were a lot of chord changes similar to the way he would put something together. And I think that his music had such a profound thing on my head. He got me going in a direction. I'm definitely proud of that tune. Hmm, I can hear that in the beginning of the cut. Yeah. You're almost waiting for Dionne Warwick to come in. <laughs> <laughs> you know, at the very beginning. We're talking to Endless Summer Quarterly editor David Beard today on the Vintage Rock and Pop Shop as we take a look at side one of Pet Sounds. And we close out the side with a song that we played a, a few weeks ago, so we're not going to do it again today. But it's obviously the big single, Sloop John B., which came out before the album. And this is another kind of controversial subject among Beach Boys fans because a lot of hardcore fans say this really doesn't belong on the album. I think it kind of does. It comes right before a break, right before you have to flip the record over and go to side two. So I could see where it might belong on the album. I've never had a problem with it. In fact, I just heard an interview with Brian recently where he said it fits perfectly. I think depending on who you talk to, like Bruce Johnston to this day feels Sloop belongs on summer days. Right. Um, 
Al Jardine, you know, I think his his thought was it was it was more a part of the '65 thing. Gex, that that is when they recorded it. They didn't do yeah. any recording on Sloop John B in '66. I think that's part of it. Um, you could say, yeah, take it out. I mean, Bruce also commented that he didn't think he didn't understand why the song Pet Sounds was on Pet Sounds uh, <laughs> because initially it's called Run James Run. Right. Brian yeah. Recorded it with the idea that. If he recorded it for a James Bond film, then he'd submit it, and then maybe they use it in a James Bond film. But he recorded it and then never submitted it, so it never went beyond the idea phase. But if that's why he wrote and recorded that, and you can hear that in the song, that vibe, then maybe it doesn't belong in the album, and then maybe you don't have a song called Pet Sounds. So I don't know. Well, I think Um, Bruce also said that he, uh, he thought Good Vibration should have been on the album, too. Well, we're getting a little ahead, but... Good Vibrations is a situation to me, I believe, that Brian had kind of learned his lesson with Help Me Rhonda. You know, he had... I see what you mean, yep. ...to a, a contract with Capitol Records and put the original version of Help Me Rhonda on the Today album. And it just cut... You know, you get to the end of it, it's just fading in, it's fading out, it's fading in. It's, right, it's yeah. completely unfinished. And, it, and it's not nearly as good as the single version, but that's a perfect example. And I think that's what you would have had, had Good Vibrations... On Pet Sounds, it would have been an incomplete thing, yep. and, and Brian didn't want to go down that road again. I really believe that. You know, you, he's probably thinking, I don't want to force a song onto an album and then have to still work on it and then have it come out again. To me, Good Vibrations was kind of the, the, the tactical, emotional zenith of what Pet Sounds became. Well, David, that is where we're going to have to leave things today. We'll get to an unused alternate ending to God Only Knows by the Beach Boys from their Pet Sounds album of 1966. Endless Summer Quarterly Magazine's David Beer joins me once again to pick up where we uh, left off last week. David, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me again. Listen, it's always a pleasure. The Beach Boys are my favorite topic to discuss on the show, so, uh, you know, we could do this every week. But uh, (laughs) listeners will recall that last week we talked about side one of Pet Sounds. This week, we're going to take a look at side two, which starts off with the song we just heard, God Only Knows. Now, despite it being such a beautiful song, I mean, you'll, you'll get no argument from anyone regarding that. Yeah. I know that Brian was a little bit nervous about releasing a pop song with the word God in the title, but it was unique for other reasons, too. Uh, Lyrically, it's the only love song that I can think of that starts with a line like, I may not always love you. I mean, that's pretty bold. It is different. My understanding is that's Brian's lyric. Um, If you hear it like, I may not always love you, but as long as there are stars above you, you never need to doubt it, which could mean... Today, I love you. I don't know about tomorrow, but if the stars come out, then you're in luck. (laughs) I don't, you know, um, it could be that type of thing. Uh, But on the other hand, it could be a weird Brian Wilson-esque backwards way of saying our love for each, my love for you is endless. Yeah. Because the stars are always out. Exactly. Um, Carl had said, I was honored to sing that one. It is so beautifully written. It sings itself. Brian said... Something like, don't do anything with it. Just sing it straight. No effort. Take a breath. Let it go real easy. That was Hmm. something Carl Wilson related in the uh, 97 box set uh, booklet. Wow. I don't know how accurate this is, but I know that Brian and Carl had prayer sessions about the song, but I think they're the only ones. Mike and and Bruce were not a part of that, they told me. Um, Carl was the one of the group who was in there, who was actually playing his 12th string and participating on the actual track recordings. Right. He was more involved. Well, it certainly became Carl's signature song with the group and was always a showstopper when they performed it live. So let's hear the Beach Boys live in 1996, the 30th anniversary of Pet Sounds, and just two years before Carl passed away with God Only Knows. We're talking with Endless Summer Quarterly Magazine's David Beard about the Beach Boys' Pet Sounds album. We're on side two. And uh, before we move on, listening to these songs, God Only Knows, and also the songs we talked about last week, uh, these tracks are are different from what the Beach Boys had done before. I mean, obviously, they'd had introspective songs, but a whole album of this kind of thing 
more or less put together in their absence while they were on the road must have been more than a little startling. It must have been the most wonderfully baffling, cool, odd moment in their lives when they came back from touring in Japan in early 66 and Brian played them the first group of tracks, some with some lyric, you know, some vocal demo. I would think that they'd be a little surprised at how willing Brian was to put himself out there in that way. I mean, that had to be the process for these guys to go, oh, wow, he's, he's laying it down. Well, that leads us to the next track on the album, I Know There's an Answer. Now, originally, this song was called Hang On to Your Ego, which caused a little concern among the group. Uh, they felt that it was a drug reference, so Mike Love wound up rewriting the lyrics, which actually work better in the context of the album. But this scenario has led to a popular myth that the Beach Boys were fighting Brian every step of the way during the making of this album. But if you listen to either the new Pet Sounds box set or the old Pet Sound Sessions box set from 1997, that's clearly not the case. No, it's not. And uh, that's not to say there weren't disagreements. Clearly, we're talking about one right now. But the disagreements were not as emotional as we, were, we would be led to believe. I don't think any of us can speak uh, directly to uh, the relationship that Mike Love and Brian Wilson had at that time. I think it's ridiculous to try. Um, I interviewed Mike, and I interviewed Al for the upcoming edition of Endless Summer Quarterly. And Mike said this, and I came up with the lyric, I know there's an answer. I was just trying to be more positive. The hang on to your ego part was a derivative of some of the LSD language and experience back in the day. Brian told me during the 2012 50th anniversary reunion tour that he was doing LSD while he was recording California Girls in 65. The language was with respect to what happened to your ego and how it got demolished. It was just drug related. And I've never been a big fan of having our message or lyrics point to that kind of experience. And I think that's a really leveled explanation. You look at what happened to Brian. You look at what he struggled with, mental illness. He will tell you, Brian Wilson will tell you today, don't do drugs. He says it in every interview. Yeah. I mean, he wrote about this. The Beach Boys came back from the tour. They recorded the original lyrics, all of them. That's why, that's why we have Hang On To Your Ego as, yep, as one of the tracks it. that you can hear on the Pet Sound Sessions box set. You can hear that with the lyrics, with, with the group singing that version. And unsolicited in my interview with Al, he brought up Mike changing the lyrics to I Know There's an Answer. And there wasn't a single thing that Al said that was anything like, oh, there was a disagreement. It wasn't that at all. It was Mike being honed and tuned in to the Beach Boys audience. And you have to remember, Brian was at home recording. The Beach Boys were the ones who were standing on stage and facing their demographic. And I think that's why the song changed. And Brian said, oh, okay. Brian re-recorded the song with I Know There's an Answer, and uh, that's what we have on the album. So for the benefit of those in the audience who may not be familiar with the song I Know There's an Answer on Pet Sounds, or the original version of the song, which has since turned up as, as a bonus track around the box set, Hang On To Your Ego, we're going to listen to a little Frankenstein creation. The first half of Hang On To Your Ego segued into the second half of the finished track, as it appears on the album, I Know There's an Answer. And as we continue talking about side two of the Beach Boys' Pet Sounds album, we're up to the track Here Today. This is sort of like the flip side of Wouldn't It Be Nice, in the sense that Wouldn't It Be Nice was a guy who was a little bit naive about romance and he was innocent. Here, this is a guy who's cynical and he's been through the mill, and he's warning someone else. It's almost like an answer to Wouldn't It Be Nice. It's saying, yeah, yeah, it, it seems great right now, but trust me, <laughs> it's it's going to go bad. This relationship, I've been there, I've been around the block. <laughs> you, you don't know what you're in store for. That's why it's so cool. That's why I think it feels like a concept album, because the things kind of point to each other. He has a little life experience under his belt by the time we get to side two. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> I hope so. Yeah, right. Well, here's where we can make a case for the original mono versions of these songs. We've played a lot of the stereo versions in this discussion, but in the original mono, especially in the instrumental portion of this song, you can hear 
the musicians talking to each other. You can hear people barking out orders. You can hear all sorts of stuff. It kind of gives it a feel of a live performance, and, and you miss some of that in the stereo version where all of that was taken out. So let's hear the original mono of the song here today. It's done. We'll be back to wrap up our discussion of the Beach Boys Pet Sounds album with editor of Endless Summer Quarterly magazine, David Beard, right after this charming retro commercial. Hi, this is Jan and Dean, and we like to take... That's us, and David Beard joins us once again to uh, continue our discussion on the Beach Boys Pet Sounds album. As much as God only knows is Carl Wilson's signature song with the group. I think the next song on side two of Pet Sounds is Brian's signature song, and that's I Just Wasn't Made for These Times. It really is. Um, This is a message for everybody. This is a message to the world. This is a message to his bandmates. This is a message to his wife. This is a message to everyone who's willing to listen. Again, understanding that most of this material is co-written with Tony Asher, so you can't overlook the fact that because Tony wrote these lyrics That's based true. on meetings he had with Brian about relationships, that you also kind of know who Tony Asher is. If you have no idea who Tony Asher is, and you've listened to Pet Sounds over and over and over and over, guess what? You know Tony Asher. I just wasn't made for these times. This is one of those songs It's so personal. And what Brian did with the, the lyrical content on, on the... Um, release, I guess you call it, um, which is where it's singing, Ain't Found the Right Thing, mm-hmm. I Can Put My Heart and Soul Into, and then under that is the O Cuando Sier Un Dia Sier, which means in English, when will I be, one day I will be. Huh. Okay? So that's what they're singing in Spanish underneath, when will I be, one day I will be. And that's underneath, Ain't Found the Right Thing, I Can Put My Heart and Soul Into. So it's very much like God Only Knows in the, in the cascading vocals. It's very much like uh, California Girls with the cascading vocals, you know, where he's, he's pulling them in. But what he did here, and I just wasn't made for these times, is he buried them more. This is, the, this is where you're beginning to see he's wanting to communicate his emotions, and emotions are different layers. And I really get that sense here that he was, he's really saying, this is who I am. And I think this song is such a tremendous eye-opener for every one of those members. It was a tremendous eye-opener for Brian because he recorded it, got it out, and I think once he had it on tape and recorded, I would be shocked if he didn't think, holy, wow, this, this, you know, I (laughs) would not be surprised if he was surprised on, on how honest it was. And I can't imagine, because the Beach Boys sound so great on it, that they didn't pick up what was going down. And that's, I think, why Don was did his documentary back in uh, 95 and called it I Just Wasn't Made for These Times because it, 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 it's a defining song for Brian. David, in our last discussion, we talked about the song that follows I Just Wasn't Made for These Times on the album, uh, the title track, Pet Sounds, the instrumental, and how it was inspired by uh, the James Bond film series, of all things. But this is as good a place as any to talk about how the album title came to be. And there's conflicting stories about that. Well, in, in the Pet Sounds 97 Sessions booklet, Brian says Carl came up with the name. I've also seen Brian in interviews say Mike named it. Mike says he named it. This is the way I put all that together. Brian and Carl were the ones who were having prayer sessions for God Only Knows. He understood what Brian was doing on a level that the others didn't, simply because he was there and he saw what Brian was doing. He heard what Brian was doing. And Carl, you know, when they toured, Carl was Brian's confidant. Right. Carl was the one who made the phone calls back home, and Brian would play him things over the phone, or he would tell him, he would bring him up to date on what he was doing. Um, and I'll tell you, I've got a book here in front of me. It's called The Beach Boys on Tour, 1966, Surfboard, Stratocaster, Striped Shirt. And it's a photo journal by Bill Yerkes. Quickly, I just want to touch on a quote from Carl. This is in Ithaca, New York, April 29th, 66. Now, Pet Sounds was released May 16th, so April 29th, 66. Mm-hmm. Backstage, this is, this is the photographer Bill Yerkes. This is his book, and this is what he wrote. After a while, Carl came in and Bruce introduced us. Carl, tell Bill about our new album, said Bruce. 
Carl started tuning up his guild and playing a few chords up the neck. He told me about their new album called Pet Sounds. It's the best we've ever done. Better than Summer Days and Summer Nights, which was my favorite so far. Yes, he said. Pet Sounds, what, the, what does that mean, I asked. Carl, it's our favorite sounds, our pet sounds. See, now, <laughs> this is a first-hand account. The album's named. Brian's doing the final mix on it. And that idea may have already been circulating and spoken out loud. So that, and again, this is complete hypothesis, but when Brian goes, what do you want to call the album? Mike says, well, what about Pet Sounds? Yeah, uh, the stories that Brian tells about the naming of the album don't really contradict each other. And, and that takes us to the final track on the album, one we've already talked about on a previous show, Caroline No. Now, it's interesting to me, and, and it plays into the idea of this being a concept album, if that's how people want to hear it, you go from the innocence of Wouldn't It Be Nice to the disillusion of Caroline No. And as the track fades, the last sound you hear on the album is a train going by in the distance and some dogs barking at it. And for me, that symbolizes loneliness. The protagonist of this album has gone through all these changes, and he's had all this life experience, and he's back where he started, totally alone. That's, that's how I hear it. Hmm. Uh, I, I, I understand some of that. Um... I think the train does have a lonely quality to it, one of, one of isolation. But at the same time, it could be like cabinescence, where it's a couple sitting together holding hands, and even though the girl's different, they're, they're sitting there with their dogs, and the dogs are barking at the train as it goes by. But he is disillusioned nonetheless. Yeah. He's unsure about what's next. Well, it's obvious that we both love this album and hold it in very high regard, but let's talk here a bit about the cover. We always talk about the covers of the, these albums, and it's been suggested that the cover of Pet Sounds doesn't do it justice. Now, I, I get the joke, Pet Sounds, they're at a petting zoo surrounded by animals, and it's certainly an iconic cover. Maybe people don't even think about it that way now, but um, I guess it's problematic. I don't know. Um Bruce said that, you know, he just figured, okay, we're at the zoo, we're petting animals, okay, pet sounds like, okay. I mean, that's, I think that's the extent of any of these guys in terms of their thought with it. They, you, you have to understand, the, the emphasis for them was the material inside. Well, it's funny you mentioned Bruce because he's in the outtakes from the album cover photos and he's represented on the back of the album, but he's, he's still not on uh, the front cover of a Beach Boys record. Yes. The reason he could not be on the album covers is he was still under contract with Columbia Records. I see. Oh, poor Bruce. He keeps missing out on these, <laughs> these album <laughs> covers. So the record comes out, and contrary to popular belief, it was not a flop. I keep reading that in reviews uh, celebrating the 50th anniversary of Pet Sounds. It reached number 10. Now, there were expectations that it would reach higher than that, but number 10 is not bad, and yet Capitol Records We touched had, on this, I think, the last time we talked. Let's, yeah. I mean, Capitol Records, the people running Capitol Records at the time, you know, I understand, I do understand, if I'm working for that company and I hear this album, Pet Sounds, and it's so different and it's so unique that I get nervous about, oh, God, their career's over. I'm going to slap together this other thing and release it two months later, yeah. uh, Best of the Beach Boys, and not having any of their biggest hits on it. Uh, but I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna put out this, pardon the phrase, bastardized release yeah. um, to capitalize on their name, and and hope that people buy this because they're not buying Pet Sounds. It was almost uh, an inadvertent sabotage. I really believe that Capital did not intend to sabotage the sales of Pet Sounds. I don't think they thought it through to that extent. I think it was a knee jerk reaction. Uh, and they saw, well, this, this music is so different. Let's remind people who they are right. and get this out during the summer. It went higher than Pet Sounds. It went to number yeah. eight. Yeah. 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 But number 10, top 10. What's wrong with number 10? 
Well, in, in Great Britain, it was a different story. The album charts at number two. It's hailed as this landmark recording in popular music, and the legend grows, and it takes a long time for that legend to make it back over to the States. And now we, today, in 2016, hold this album with the same high uh, esteem as uh, our cousins in Great Britain did for many years. But uh, initially, Lennon and McCartney heard an early pressing of the album before it came out, and it influenced uh, their music. Right. Bruce Johnston has said that after John Lennon and Paul McCartney heard Pet Sounds when they visited him in his suite in Mm -hmm. uh, London in uh, May of 66, after hearing Pet Sounds, they started right away on Here, There, and Everywhere. I think from the outside looking in, you can say, oh, it's competition. Uh, I don't really believe that it was ever competition. Um, I I believe it was uh, honest uh, energy uh, fueled by the desire to make something as creative as what you just experienced. From the Revolver album, The Beatles, with the very Beach Boys influenced here, there, and everywhere. And of course, Pet Sounds would go on to inspire the spirit behind uh, the Sgt. Pepper album. David Beard of Endless Summer Quarterly Magazine is joining us as we uh, wrap up this discussion. And normally around this time, we talk about some uh, Beach Boys news, but you made some uh, Beach Boys news uh, recently. You won an award, didn't you? Oh, yeah, I, I did. Um, <laughs> it was the, it's the Communicators Award. Um, Last year, I had I had the good fortune of being selected to design the Beach Boys official tour program mm-hmm. for their Summer Days and Summer Nights tour, and that uh, program received the Communicators Award of Distinction for design of the tour program. So it, that was a a really cool um, surprise, and uh, honored to have worked with Mike uh, Love and, and Bruce Johnson to put that together. And the greatest thing, even though Mike is the one touring under, you know, he's licensed the name, the programs represent all the members. Yet the Summer Days program is a chronology of events of when Bruce Johnston joined in April of 65, and it incorporates Help Me Rhonda single. Mike is complimentary of Al singing on that song. It's, it's a really all-inclusive historic look at the group in 65. And, um, I got uh, lucky again. I I just did the uh, 2016 tour program and uh, had the good fortune of doing that with Dean Torrance of Jan and Dean, who's also a graphic designer, for those who don't know. As a Jan and Dean fan, that was just cool in itself to get to work with him. Yeah. But you can go to MikeLove.com right now, and then when you go there, you can see the tour dates. You can click. There's a shop button, and you can go there, and you can buy. There's one of two different VIP packages. One's a gold uh, package and one's a uh, platinum package, and uh, as opposed to try to recite all that information, I just pass on to your listeners to go to MikeLove.com and then click on the shop button, and it'll show you the two different VIP packages. You get an autographed copy of Mike's book coming out, uh, Good Vibrations, My Life as a Beach Boy. Uh, it's coming out in September. Um, you get a hardcover 12 by 12, 68 page coffee table book that I put together in addition to the tour program. This coffee table book is hardcover. It's got handwritten sheet uh, music inside for Wouldn't It Be Nice? And Mike is the one who hand wrote it, and also Good Vibrations. And uh, there's a USB that comes with it, the hardcover book, that has rare footage of the Beach Boys included on it. Very, very cool. And, of course, Brian Wilson is out there touring behind the album we just got finished talking about, Pet Sounds, the 50th anniversary tour. And uh, he's got some VIP packages, too, doesn't he? He sure does. You just go to brianwilson.com, click on Tour, and then you can... There's there's the two things down below when you get to that page, and uh, there are two different types of VIP packages you can get for Brian's tour as well, and include, like Mike's. Uh, but it's it's such a great time to be a fan of the Beach Boys because if you go see Brian, you know, he's performing Pet Sounds in its entirety. He's got Al Jardine with him. He's got Matt Jardine with him. Of course, he's got his great band, um, Blondie Chaplin, who, you know, sings some of the other uh, recordings. Not not any of the Pet Sounds albums, but he does come out and participate at other points in the show. Um, Brian's right there, front and center, up on the stage, and he, uh, you know, he, he brings his heart to every performance, and... Uh, 
having Brian do Pet Sounds in its entirety, that's something I've experienced before back in 2000 when he first did it. It's really special. If you've never seen it performed live, it's certainly worth the trip. And his tour dates will be uh, on that page as well, brianwilson.com tour. And you and I often talk about dates, chart positions, when things were worked on or released. And I would love to point fans to uh, esquarterly.com because when you get there, and it's there's the music, <laughs> play music, and you're going to be looking at the page. And above the jukebox are three wooden signposts that are uh, nailed to a Hawaiian tree. <laughs> And the middle one, well, the top one, subscribe to, to the magazine. You click on that, it'll take you right to the page in our site to subscribe to the magazine for four years. We have direct access to the Beach Boys. We have content and interviews you're not going to get anywhere else. We're the official, unofficial Beach Boys magazine. Right. Um, but the, the next one is Bellagio. And what that is, it's named after a, a street that Brian lived on in California, but a great site by Andrew Doe, and he's got a lot of really important historians from the Beach Boys world working and contributing, and myself, Ian Rustin, Craig Slowinski, Peter Ream, uh, Lee Dempsey. We each have our specific kind of thing that we're, you know, that we do, and, and Andrew just, this site is so worthwhile that people can look in the shows and sessions section year by year and see, okay, oh, I see these are the tour dates where the Beach Boys were on tour. And then you see the recording sessions for different albums. In this particular case, Pet Sounds, you can go to late 65 and then into 66. You could see when and where the studios where Brian was working on Pet Sounds. Now, has it got every detail? Not about their what kind of car they drove, none of that. Right. Um, <laughs> but where they were, what, what tour dates, were the city and the state they played on certain dates, and, and uh, what they were recording when they weren't on tour, what Brian was working on, or, you know, all that. It's there. Go through it and explore. Very cool. Well, There's one other thing I want to mention, oh, okay. too. Um, there's a new community forum for Beach Boys fans, and it's called the Pet Sounds Forum. And it's at beachboys.boards.net. Huh. Um, it's a brand new one. I, I, I don't know how long it's been up. I, I want to say much more than a week, but I think it's a, it's a good place to kind of reboot serious Beach Boy fans who, who want to talk about music. It um, doesn't have a whole lot of members yet, but it's, cert- it's worth checking out and, and giving an opportunity and, and, and finding a good place to communicate with other Beach Boy fans. I'm, I'm one of the members, so check it out. Um, in terms of the next issue of Endless Summer Quarterly, it'll be out very soon in mid-June mm-hmm. to coincide with the new box set. And it's got lots of the stuff that came out in 97, but, you know, they, they're able to make it sound even better today. And as history is <laughs> kind of repeating itself, Capitol Records has just released the two LP vinyl of Sounds of Summer. <laughs> well, yeah, there it is. History is repeating itself. They don't have to worry. I think Pet Sounds is going to sell. Yes. The summer edition of Endless Summer Quarterly, summer 2016, the contents are brand new interviews with Mike Love, Alan Jardine, and Bruce Johnston about Pet Sounds. And uh, there's some stories in there that uh, I've not read before. The summer 2016 edition of Endless Summer Quarterly is a must-have. All right. I couldn't have said it better myself. And I believed uh, we talked about this before, but the fall issue will focus on good vibrations. Yeah. So there's a lot uh, still to come in, in Beach Boys World. And to wrap up this conversation, I wanted to play a track from uh, the Wilsons, Brian's daughters, Wendy and Carney, because people wonder, did Brian ever work with Tony Asher again? After Pet Sounds, did Tony ever provide lyrics to a a Brian Wilson song? Well, they did work together again, and the fruits of that labor are on uh, the Wilson's album of 1997, a song called Everything I Need. Yeah, and the the Wilson girls recorded it with Brian. Um, And I know that the girls are popular because of Wilson Phillips, but the Wilson's album puts anything they did with Wilson Phillips to shame. To me, the Wilson's album, you're talking about everything I need, that's their pet sounds. That's the girls' pet sounds. Once again, David, always a pleasure, and I look forward to uh, the next time we speak when I'm sure we'll be talking about the release of the Good Vibration single 
So thank you for participating in this extended conversation about a Beach Boys album. Two shows, my goodness. Wonderful, thanks. (laughs) All right, bye-bye. Bye.